Hi hey everyone, we're going to continue on our talk of uh, vector and tensor algebra today. We'll have a couple more lectures on it, not too many, um, probably like three. Hopefully finish that up this week, if not early next, and then we'll move on to differentiation and integration. Uh, those will move a lot more quickly. I mean, even if you look in the book, the, uh, the tensor algebra section is probably 30 pages long or something, <coughs> maybe even close to 40, whereas the differentiation is like 10 pages and integration is maybe five or six. Um, so, you know, pretty soon we'll be moving into the meat of <coughs> the continuum mechanics parts of it, um, which should be exciting, you know. It's really the... Uh, balance laws and thermodynamic consistency principle of virtual work um, and then constitutive theory and how that fits in with the second law of thermodynamics is you know what continuum mechanics is all about that would be you know what would be called the rational mechanics in the theory of say Truesdell or Knoll um, but the, the underpinnings of all of that is really being able to <clears throat> understand vector and tensor algebra and calculus from a, a direct notation and fundamental perspective um, so that you can talk about the forms of invariance. In other words, what happens shouldn't depend on how you describe it. Um, so. I understand this is probably pretty boring stuff and you know it, the applications of it aren't too clear but um, it's really it's necessary to being able to describe motions and deformations and everything in a way that's going to be useful and not tied to any particular choice of way of looking at it. <coughs> All right, so we go on to the trace of a tensor, the inner product brought about by the trace, and the magnitude of a tensor brought about by the inner product. So the trace is a linear operation that assigns a scalar value to tensors. So the linear is part of the definition of the trace. All right, give me one second. I'm gonna get something to prop this iPad up on so as to have a little better handwriting. <clears> Hell <throat> oh, yeah, that's the one thing with these is uh, it's kind of hard to get them at an orientation where writing on them with the stylus feels all that natural. That was definitely one thing that was nicer about the chalkboard. All right, so it's a linear operation. It's like if you lay them flat, they, uh, they want to rotate all random ways because they can't tell which way is up, so you have to have them <clears throat> propped up just a little bit, but you prop them up too far and it's like writing on something weird. So we're going to denote the space of tensors on a vector space V as just lin V. Um, we've been doing lin V comma V, so V is both the source space and the target space. Um, since V is always going to be both, we'll just let this notation mean that. 
And if there's ever a time when the source space and target space are different, then we'll list source followed by target. <coughs> so again, lin v is the space of second order tensors on v. And it's mapping that to a real number. Well, interestingly, this means that trace is an element of the dual space to lin v, since lin v is itself a vector space, and it's a linear map from that to a real number. <coughs> All right, so the trace satisfies the following for the tensor product of two vectors. The trace of vector u, tensor product vector v, is equal to <clears throat> u dot v. <clears throat> so that is uh, for all u and v in the vector space v. Um, and that's a useful thing, but we can't necessarily say anything about how to get the trace of, you know, we, we want to get the trace of trace of any tensor S, where S is, say, equal to S, I, J, E, I, tensor E, J. Um, we can't do anything for this directly from this without the fact that the trace is defined to be linear. So because we've defined it to be linear, we can calculate this. Otherwise, this doesn't give you a nice extension to what to do for here. But because we've defined it to be linear, And so basically it is <coughs> the unique linear operation that is one linear and two satisfies this. Um, the trace of alpha S, where S is a tensor, plus beta T, where T is a tensor, is equal to alpha times the trace s plus beta times the trace of t. And that's for all real numbers, alpha and beta. And for all s and t in lin v. OK, so we can now revisit what the trace of a general tensor is. That is equal to the trace of s i j. E I tensor E J, which is by definition up here, and linearity, uh, that's going to be equal to S I J trace rate. So these are just the scalar components. They can move out of the trace. EI tensor EJ, <coughs> which is equal to SIJ EI dot EJ. So if the E is any old basis, this is as far as we can take it. Whereas if the E's are an orthonormal basis, and you know in this class we'll always use orthonormal bases for proving things, since you can always 
make one, <coughs> then we get this. Right, so if sij, or rather if the e's are orthonormal, then ei dot ej is delta ij. So that is equal to si i. All right, so because the inner product is symmetric, u dot v vectors is equal to v dot u, then um, the trace of u tensor v is equal to the trace of v tensor product u, like that. <clears throat> so from there, it follows that the trace of s transpose is equal to the trace of s. Well, <coughs> the trace is linear, so the trace of the scalar multiple of a tensor is equal to the scalar multiple of the trace. So that would mean the transpose of a skew symmetric is equal to minus a, that same skew symmetric tensor. So if the trace of minus w is equal to the trace of w, if w is a skew symmetric tensor, then it follows that um, the trace of all skew symmetric tensors has to be 0. So the trace of the skew symmetric part of any tensor is 0 for all s. <clears throat> and the trace of s <clears throat> is equal to the trace of the symmetric part of s for all s. In the textbook, if you look at um, equation 243, 2.43, they have a number of useful identities about the trace. Um, and all of, but one of them are pretty obvious. So we'll go and examine the one that's not pretty obvious and demonstrate that it's the case. Uh, with the caveat that the trace of the identity tensor equaling 3 <coughs> is applicable only when the dimension of the vector space is 3. All right, so let's look at this kind of, oopsies. I didn't want to make that dot there. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, this here one that I'm saying is not, you know, all the other ones are like one steppers. You look at them and it's like, okay, that, duh. But this one is, uh, 
I don't know, like a three stepper, something like that. <clears throat> so let's let's prove that that's the case. Well, first, if we look at the tensor S times the tensor T, that is equal to S I J. This is relative to an orthonormal basis now. So we're going to prove this in components, which is a perfectly valid way of proving things. Um, <clears throat> you'll be doing that a lot when we start working on differentiation and stuff. You'll just use a Cartesian frame, so, you know, a fixed orthonormal basis and XYZ coordinates, and, um, you know, there, there will be coordinate changes and things if you wanted to apply it to, oh, say, cylindrical coordinates or spherical, but the, um, <clears throat> we'll be proving kind of the direct result using the components. Um, and then when, when we go to do the differentiation, there will be derivatives of unit, well, of your, your basis vectors that would need to be considered if you wanted to do a change of coordinates later. But it doesn't change the truth of the direct notation statement that we're proving using components. All right. <clears throat> so at any rate, that's equal to Sij Ei tensor Ej orthonormal basis, right? We put the hats over it. Um, and then we used up ij, so we need to use different dummy indices. So we'll say t, k, l, e, k, tensor, e, l. Give them their adornments there. All right. Well, that is equal to we can move the scalar components wherever we want them because they're not doing anything to the vector operations or the tensor product or anything. S I J T K L. So when we multiply this one by this one, you know, this is the tensor products, of course, the order of multiplication does matter. And so if you were to imagine, say, you know, we'll write it over here. Can we get like a different color? Ooh, look at that. Getting real fancy now. All right, so like um, V dot. <clears throat> e I tensor. E J mm -hmm. E. I guess we don't even need that V dot there to prove the point, do we? Let's get rid of that. No need to overly complicate things, All right? E K tensor. E L U is equal to E I. Eh, let's just move all that down here. So we'll just kind of make ourselves a little aside here for a second. I didn't want that. Stop. Undo. <clears throat> All right. Let's go back to our side. E I tensor E J E K tensor E L 
acting on u. Well, that is equal to ei tensor ej acting on e l dot u e k right so we just applied the definition of the tensor product to this <clears throat> all right well that is equal to Right, so now we have the ek dot ej, ei times ek dot ej. <coughs> el dot u, which is equal to E I tensor E L E J dot E K U. So in other words, <coughs> when you multiply two tensor products like this together, um, you know, the inside two are going to get dotted with each other, and your remaining tensor is the first one of this one and the second one of the second one. All right, so we can go back to what we were doing before. Come on. So going back to this, is equal to S I J T K L E J dot E K E I tensor product E L. All right, well, since we've picked an orthonormal basis, oh God, we got stuff on the screen there. <clears throat> All right, that's equal to. S I J T K L delta, we don't need that there, delta J K E I tensor product E L. And so we can replace K with J wherever it appears and get rid of the delta since it's zero whenever J is not equal to K. That's equal to S I J T J L <coughs> E I tensor E L. Okay, so now we can look at taking the trace of that. <coughs> That's equal to the trace. of S I J T J L E I tensor E L we can move the scalar components out of the trace So that is equal to S I J T J L E I dot E L, which is equal to S I J T J L delta I L, which is then S I J T J I. Blech. 
All right, so by the same logic, the trace of T S is equal to T I J S J I. And we can switch i and j in that since they're both dummy indices. So we can do is equal to t j i s i j. <coughs> well, those are just scalar components. So we can switch, you know, the order there since the um, association of your rows and columns, or however you want to think about it, <coughs> is um, accommodated by the indices here and not by the left-right ordering. So that is equal to S-I-J-T-J-I. -I. Sure enough, that, which is equal to the trace of S-T, is equal to that, which is the trace of T-S. So we've, um, we've proven that one, and it checks out. All right, a deviatoric tensor is one for which the trace is zero. <clears throat> and every tensor can be decomposed into the sum of a deviatoric, so traceless, and a spherical, which would be a isotropic or scalar multiple of the identity tensor part. <clears throat> and that decomposition is unique. And it's an easy one to calculate which is always nice with tensor decompositions. Um, some of the useful ones are easy to calculate. Some of them are quite difficult. So S, any tensor, is equal to S minus, and this is only applicable to three dimensions. Otherwise, it would be 1 over the dimension instead of 1 over 3. Trace S times the identity, and then plus <coughs> 1 third trace s times the identity. So in other words, we've subtracted that and added it back on. So of course, it's equal to that. Well, this part here is the deviatoric part of s, which the book will sometimes denote as s0. And this is the spherical part of s, which the book is going to note as little scalar s times the identity. And this decomposition um, features 
when you're doing um say fluid mechanics and you're looking at the stress then um you split it up into the deviatoric part and the isotropic or spherical part and the spherical part is like your pressure and the deviatoric part is like your shear stresses <coughs> and there's this thing called the stokes hypothesis which is that you know, the mechanical and thermodynamic pressure are equal. And so then all of your viscous terms should go to this one. And all of your pressure terms should go to this one. Um, and we'll talk about that later on. The trace induces a natural inner product on the space of tensors. That's not the line. Second order tensors have a natural inner product, and we'll denote that using a colon instead of a dot, even though it would be correct to use a dot because it's an inner product between vectors. Um, the textbook uses a colon, a lot of other places do, and it's really to just distinguish the inner product on the vector space of second order tensors versus the inner product on the vector space of vectors, because they are both vector spaces, but they're not the same vector space. And so it would make sense to use different notation for it. So we'll denote that as like S colon T. <clears throat> and it is the inner product of S and T. If I can draw a T. Don't do that. It is equal to the trace. How do I make that? Of S transpose T which also happens to be equal to the trace of S T transpose. Um, the textbook says that, <coughs> but looking at it, you know, this here is not the transpose of this. And we had said that the trace of S transpose is equal to the trace of S. Um, but that's not quite what that is. So, you know, it's worth investigating. Is this actually equal to this? And you should always ask yourselves these questions when there's something that you can prove and try to prove it. So does the trace of S transpose T <clears throat> equal the trace of S T transpose. Well, first, <clears throat> because I don't think that we actually explicitly showed it, um, although I do believe that the textbook did, Let's show that the transpose of AB is B transpose A transpose. So I'm going to say AB, that whole thing transpose is equal to B transpose A transpose. <clears throat> Because, let's look at V dot A, B, U. Well, 
bu is just a vector. So by the definition of the transpose of a, that is equal to a transpose v <coughs> dot bu. And then we can multiply that. You know, we can use the definition of the transpose of b now. That is equal to b transpose a transpose v dot u. And so we've shown that this is a b transpose. All right, that's good. You would hope that that would be the case. <coughs> Well, we've already shown that the trace of S is equal to the trace of S transpose. Then we have that the trace of S transpose T is equal to the trace of that whole thing transpose. Which is equal to, hey, I don't want that. Come back. The trace of T transpose S which is still not quite what we're looking for, right? We want S T transpose. Well, we showed earlier that um, the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA. So thinking of T transpose as a tensor in its own right, <coughs> the trace of T transpose S is then equal to the trace of S T transpose, which is equal to the trace of S transpose T. So that's cool. We're good. But now, <clears throat> you know, we've shown that these two operations give the same result. But we should investigate whether this function that maps a pair of second order tensors to a real number is, in fact, an inner product, because we can show that. Um, so inner products have three properties. They're symmetric. They're linear in one argument, and the symmetry implies that they are symmetric, or rather linear in both, and they're positive definite. So we've kind of already shown that it's symmetric, but uh, yeah. So we have S colon T is defined as the trace of S transpose <coughs> T. And since uh, <coughs> the trace of the transpose of a tensor is equal to the trace of the original tensor, that is equal to the trace of T transpose S. Well, by the definition of this inner product thing that we've given here, that is equal to T colon S. So it's definitely symmetric. <coughs> 
Is it linear in the first argument? That's a terrible question mark. I wish you wouldn't. There you go. All right, so we got alpha s plus beta t interproducted with another tensor that we'll call V. Well, that is kind of by definition, the trace of the transpose of that whole mess there. All multiplying V. All right, well, the trace itself is linear, so that is equal to alpha trace S transpose V plus beta trace <coughs> T transpose V. All right, well, by our definition of the inner product, Thing that is going to be equal to alpha s colon v plus beta t colon v. So it's linear in the first argument. And, you know, we didn't even have to <coughs> make recourse to scale or component arguments or anything. Um, in general, if you can prove something without making recourse to scalar components. It's a stronger result. However, it's, you know, perfectly adequate and often easier to prove things using the scalar components. All right, three. Is it positive definite? And this one's going to be easier to prove using scalar components. Well, relative to an orthonormal basis, We have that any tensor S is equal to S I J E I tensor E J. <coughs> S inner product itself is equal to the trace of S transpose S. And that is equal to the trace of S I K and now we're going to get clever and do the E K first so that it's the transpose tensor E I right so that is <coughs> the transpose since the second argument of the um, list of scalars is the first vector in the tensor product, and the first one is the second. And then times S L J, we can't use I or K again. E L tensor E J. So I kind of strategically picked the K here and the L here because I wanted the first one here to be an I, and the second one here to be a J. Let's say, uh, yeah, the first one here to be an I, and the second one here to be a J. <coughs> All right, so that is equal to the trace of, we can just move the scalar components, and you know, you'll have this EI dot, whoopsies. <coughs> 
yeah, we'll move the scalar components to the front here. And then you'll have ei.el. And then ek tensor ej. Well, that's equal to the trace S I K S L J Delta I L E K tensor product E J. So we can replace L with I and get rid of Delta I L. That is equal to the trace. S I K S I J E K tensor E J. <clears throat> Can move the scalar components outside of the trace since it's linear. Times the trace E K tensor. E J. We know what to do with that now. That's just going to be E K dot E J. Which is of course delta K J. So we can replace K with J. <clears throat> so it is S I J S I J, the square of each of the components of S I J relative to the basis E I tensor E J. Well, the ten since E I tensor E J is a basis for Lin V, we know that S, the tensor, is equal to the zero tensor if and only if sij is equal to 0 for all i and j. Well, for each i and j, sij times sij is greater than or equal to 0, right, because it's a square of a real number. <clears throat> and sij, sij, so here we're not implying the summation, is equal to 0 implies that, well, if and only if sij is equal to 0. So this is for a fixed i and a fixed j. Well, if you're summing a bunch of non-negative numbers, then the sum of them can be 0 if and only if each of them is identically 0. So here we are implying the summation convention. That's all greater than or equal to 0 because right, it's a sum of non-negative numbers. And sij, sij is equal to 0 <coughs> if and only if sij is equal to 0 for all ij, which we said would mean that s has to be equal to 0. So tensor s, tensor inner product s, is in fact greater than or equal to the scalar 0. And s, tensor s, equals 0 if and only if s, the tensor, is equal to tensor 0. So in fact, we have shown then that um, 
that it is an inner product. There are some more identities in the book um, on this topic and really on a lot of other topics. And, you know, we're not going to have time to cover every single identity or formula in class, but they're all useful in their own way. Um, so I definitely recommend, you know, if you haven't been, like do read the chapters and um, do some of the exercises that they give. They give a lot of exercises, so you don't have to do every single one. Um, but I find that they're all pretty easy. Um, you know, unfortunately, the textbook doesn't have a solution manual, so I can't, like, give you guys limited access to the solution manual so you can go through and make sure that you're doing it the right way. Um, but, you know, the exercises in the textbook are all pretty doable. Um, even years ago when I went through the class, you know, I found the first time seeing all this stuff, it was pretty understandable. You know, you don't sit there and really wonder whether you got the right answer. So go through, do some of the exercises as you're reading it. Um, and, you know, even though they're not your homework, if you do one and don't understand it or want someone to look at it, I'll happily look at your work. Um, that's why I'm here, is to help you guys learn this. So, you know, whatever works for you, I'd like to do it that way. All right, so there's also a norm or magnitude induced by the inner product. <clears throat> this is a norm of a tensor. And this is what you would call the Frobenius norm. Um, in, in terms of like coming up with bounds on the magnitude of S tensor times vector V relative to the magnitude of vector V, so the magnitude of you know, the vector outcome relative to the magnitude of the vector, the Frobenius norm isn't really the one that you want. The one that you want is the operator norm. <coughs> um, but the operator norm is very difficult to calculate. Um, it involves like the singular value decomposition, whereas the Frobenius norm is quite easy to calculate. And um, at least it is useful in a way in that it bounds the operator norm. So the inner product of tensors induces a norm on lin v. And so this is always the case with an inner product, that it induces a norm. And so we'll say at the norm of S. I'll put a little F here for Frobenius, but it is just the norm as far as the textbook is concerned. So you don't need the S, or rather the F there. And that's defined as the square root of S inner product S, like that. <coughs> All right, so like I said, it's useful in that it's consistent with the inner product, and it's easy to calculate, but often the operator norm is more useful. I'll put a little OP there. So that's defined as the supremum, or the maximum value that it achieves or the limiting maximum value, really, over all v in the vector space of the s v. So this is the vector norm over the vector norm of v. <coughs> is more useful 
when the vector space has the Euclidean norm, and we do here, then um, so that would be your you know square norm. Then um, the operator norm is less than or equal to the Frobenius norm. <clears throat> so that's at least useful that we can bound it with a relatively easy to calculate norm. In general, um, when the vector space is has the Euclidean norm. Then uh, the operator norm is the square root. of the maximum singular value of s. Where the singular values are the eigenvalues of s, s transpose. And um, since s, s transpose is real, those, or rather is symmetric, those are guaranteed to be real. But of course, it is difficult to calculate eigenvalues and all that happiness. So we, uh, we like to stick with the Frobenius norm when we can. All right, that's, uh, that's all we got for this. Try to get another lecture out hopefully later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, hopefully, you guys like this homework scheme where you guys get to take the solutions and identify where you went astray and kind of correct it and get half the points back. Um, I think that's probably more useful because it forces you to understand this stuff. And, you know, you have the option of not participating. You can have me just grade it and give it whatever grade you would have got. Um, but, hey, why, uh, why leave half your points on the table, right? Okay, we're going to assign a second homework on tensor algebra in a little bit here. And, um, you know, you'll be able to do probably half of it already. And by the time you get through another couple lectures, you'll be able to do the rest of it. Um, all right, catch you later.